What is China doing in the South China Sea? If you followed Asian news for the past couple of years, or if you are from the Far East yourself, you know that there have been territorial disputes in Asia between various Asian nations ever since the end of World War II, when they step by step regained independence and subsequently all wanted to reacquire lost historical territory. All of the countries involved have overlapping claims with everyone else in the region, which gets very confusing quickly, and there is no good guy versus bad guy dichotomy. However, the most important nation in all of these disputes is the People's Republic of China, which has overlapping claims with India, Mongolia, Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Brunei, and Malaysia, and a couple of others I can't think of right now. And in the past, there was even struggle between North Korea and China over their shared border. But why is that? On the one hand, one could simply shout land grabbing. And be done with it. But the truth of the matter is that this discussion about China's expansion is much broader, complex, and with a much older history and far greater magnitude than most Westerners would like to believe. But since this is a video series about the Philippines, I'll attempt to give you the Cliff Notes version in the shortest amount of time possible. Basically, China's actions have two sides to them: the historical and the current one. Let's look at the history first. Part one: the historical context. To start off, when we study Chinese literature, or when you talk to Chinese about classical literature, or even the North-South division, you will sooner or later talk about Chu Zi, or songs of Chu, or other similar poetry.、But、the fascinating part of it is that the state of Chu used to be China's south, and culturally speaking, is still often considered the south. Even though, by looking at modern maps, it's pretty far north. Anyway, the important bit is that the Chinese cultural south is far more northern than its political south, and that for centuries China has been expanding towards the south for various reasons. From this point of view, topics like the Nine Dash Line can be viewed as a continuation of a century-long trend. And we can see this trend materializing even when we talk about pre-colonial Philippine history, or look at the beginning of colonial history in the Philippines. For example, and without going too much into detail here, there was this letter in 1661 by Zhang Chongguang, who's also known as the father of the nation, Guo Xingye, a Chinese merchant prince and Ming Dynasty loyalist. Who wrote a letter to Spanish Governor General Sabiniano Manrique de Lara, stating that by invading what we now know as the Philippines, the Spanish invaded Chinese territories? That meant that instead of the native leaders, the Spanish now had to pay tributaries to the Chinese emperor. If they failed, the Philippines would then be invaded by Ming's naval forces. That claim by Zheng sounds odd. If you are not aware of pre-colonial Philippine history, but it makes more sense when you know more about the dynamic there and how the Chinese viewed some of the places in the archipelago. One of the more easily visible remnants of the tributary state period is the grave of Sultan Paduka Pahala of Sulu, or as it is known in China, Sulu Wangmu, which can be found in Dezhou. If you want to look him up, the Sultan is also known among historians as the Eastern King or Dong Wang. In his journey to pay tribute to the emperor, the Sulu king fell ill and died on his way back home. But his grave very well demonstrates how、um, local diseases can affect foreign immune systems, but more importantly, how the Chinese Empire treated its tributaries. And it is also important to keep in mind that the tributary states were not part of China, but individual states that were protected by it and had special benefits due to that. Also remember that not every tribute payer was granted the state morpheme or guo at the end of their country's name. That morpheme was actually a badge of honor and a sign that China recognized your people as civilized. At least that's the official version, of course. In reality, there was quite a bit of behind-the-scenes politics involved. With that in mind, we will see Luzon, not the island, but basically parts of central Luzon, was referred to in. Pre-17th-century Chinese and Japanese records as State of Luzon or Luzonguo. Now back to the Ming loyalist Zheng Chongguang and his threat against the Spanish. Before his letter, two important events transpired. First came the attack by a Chinese pirate, who'd actually be better referred to as a de facto warlord. 
because shortly after the Spanish conquered Luzon, the Conquista was attacked by a massive Chinese fleet led by a pirate called Lin Feng, who is better known in the Philippines as Lim Ahong, or by some people as the father of Filipino Chinese. Anyway, he and his troops of several tens of thousands of soldiers landed in Logosur in 1574 and fought their way to Paranaque, where they fought the Spanish on November 29th, 1574. They were almost successful and their entire place was burned down due to them. The Spanish barely made it, but because of this exhausting battle, they were henceforth immensely scared of the Chinese in general, which you can see in various expulsion acts for example later in the colonial history. After everything had been burned down, the Conquista also decided that they needed to rebuild their base, Fort Santiago, but out of stone. Something that we can still admire today and which is known locally as Intramuros. The other important event was the Dutch conquering the island of Taiwan, rarely called Formosa, and the Ming loyalist Zheng Chenggong then defeating them. Between 1661 and 1663, Zheng attacked the Dutch settlements, obliterated them, and founded his base of operation on Taiwan, hence the nickname Father of the Nation, Guo Xingye. Because of him, Taiwan was incorporated into China and Chinese became its official language. Having seen the capabilities of both the pirate Lin and the loyalist Zheng, the Spanish rightfully feared an impending attack from China. However, Zheng died before he could strike and his claim was laid down by his successor, Zheng Jing. And more importantly, the Qing dynasty replaced the Ming dynasty. However, imagine if Zheng Jing had actually followed his father's plans. The Philippines, or at least parts of it, might now be part of China. In any case, what we can see here is that China, historically speaking, has always been expanding southwards and that there were attempts to integrate the Philippines as soon as in the 16th century and 17th century. But that's centuries ago, so let's go to the more pressing issue of the 20th and 21st century. Part 2. Current Context, aka the Economical and Political Aspect Now while the historical bits are intriguing from an academic point of view, they can at times wander off into what-if spiels. The current context, on the other hand, is far more important to our present situation in Asia. To again summarize things as much as possible, we only need to look at the map of uh, population density in China. As you can see on this map, most people live on the east side, near the ocean. When you then look at other maps, you'll logically find that most factories, most of the infrastructure and most political decision making will be found there as well, near the ocean. The more western parts of China are not as developed, that is partially due to deserts, partially due to inaccessible mountain ranges and other natural hindrances. What I'm trying to say is that everything of high relevance is on the east side. Additionally, China's current economy not only exports a lot, they are largely dependent on international trade. China is one of the leading exporters in the world and uses the ocean to ship its products. At this point, we can finally look at the ocean itself to see why that's relevant. First thing you'll see is that China has no open access to the ocean, but instead is surrounded by other countries. Most importantly, many of the nations around China's coast are US American allies. That also is not a coincidence, but goes back to the Cold War era, wherein the USA wanted to stop the spreading of communism. In modern context, these nations serve as a long-range shield for the USA against China. And everyone in Asia is aware of that. That is why in the 2016 presidential elections in the Philippines, an alliance with the USA was one of the topics that candidates discussed. In any case, before you jump to conclusions, after World War II, many countries, for example Vietnam, weren't granted independence and so many people chose communism, not because they believed in it, but because it was opposite to the system the Western colonial powers used. Choosing communism was a means to regain power and punish those that collaborated with the colonizers. Communists rode on a platform of driving the imperial powers out of Asia and without taking sides and no matter how much you hate communism, it's a sentiment that every single Asian can understand because we all know the pain that colonialism left behind. Anyway, back during the Cold War, China introduced several plans to lessen the influence of the USA in the region. One of the plans relevant to the Philippines is the first island chain. This island chain 
goes alongside where the Nine Dash Line is in the South China Sea, the Yellow Sea and the East China Sea. According to some sources, the island chain is to be completed by 2020 or 2025. Supposing that that is true, the rising pan Far Eastern tension in the past couple of years is no coincidence. To summarize, China's economy depends largely on exports, but to export their products they have to go through other nations' territories. They are unhappy with the US American presence in the region, which most Asians are to some extent as well. And they want to gain control over the ocean because of this. Of course, the South China Sea also has more to offer like fishing grounds, which China might require for its population, or the oil and natural gas that even people in the West know about. Now, of course, there are other elements to this relevant for the Philippines, like when a Taiwanese news outlet stated in 2012 that China stationed the 827th Missile Brigade of the 2nd Artillery Corp in Shaoguan City in Guangdong, or the verdict of the United Nations Arbitral Tribunal over the South China Sea, which went in favor of the Philippines. At the end of the day, I would like to remind people that calm talks and diplomacy are better than any military threat or action. And even if you disagree with any government's decisions, or even if you disagree with me, most people you'll meet or talk to from the other country are not government. They are just regular folk. If you want peace, it's more important that we'll all learn the other side of the story, hear everyone out, and then try to find a middle ground that we'll all be happy with. Thanks for watching.